welcome to our London History Podcast, where we share our love of London, its people, places and history in 20-minute espresso shot episodes served with a dash of personality. I am your host, Hazel Baker, London tour guide and CEO of London Guided Walks, providing private tours, treasure hunts, guided walks and live London quizzes to Londoners and visitors alike. We also have a second podcast called The Daily London, providing inspiration for things to do in London, yes, even in lockdown 2.0. It's just a couple of minutes every day, giving you a bit of inspiration for things to do in London for Londoners. One of the most popular things that I get asked, a lot of people are interested in, are the street names and how they got their name. And we have some really strange ones in London. So I put it to our followers on social media, Instagram, Twitter and Facebook um, and asked them what street name they would like covering in this podcast. The most popular response was Little Britain, as upvoted by Julie Gary and Gita. So this one is for you. Little Britain is a street in the City of London and measures approximately 285 metres in length. It crosses postcodes of EC1A4 and also EC1A7. For those of you unfamiliar with London postcodes, the EC stands for East and Central. And it's a group of districts in central London, uh, City of London, and also parts of the boroughs of Islington, Hackney, Tower Hamlets, Camden and Westminster. The average house in Little Britain sells for £903,129.17. And And as unique as it sounds, there are in fact three other streets named Little Britain in Great Britain. It's an interesting small neighbourhood consisting of a cluster of evocative narrow streets and courts. It's a narrow widening street near Smithfield Market and it's recently had a new facelift really with all the development work around due to St Bartholomew's Hospital. It's in Aldersgate Ward and Farringdon Ward without. So that is the same area that we do Bleeding Hearts Body Parts Tour and also our Heretics and Horrors. It's a fantastically wonderful historic area of town. And the first mention of Lytton Britain Street is in 1600s. However, how it's got its name uh, may give you a little bit of a hint of what it was named previously. As with the ever-changing London, it has had several names prior to that. Uh, one, Brittone Street, uh, 1329. Also, Britton Street, so B-R-I-T-T-E-N Street. Uh, Petit Britanne, um, also Petit Britannier, 1561. Little Breton, as in L-Y-T-T-E-L, and then Little Britannia um, afterwards. So there's quite a few different variations of something. We know Little and we also have Britain or Britain. And this is uh, taking its name from the Dukes of Britain, B-R-I-T-O-N, who uh, lodged there. Um, now, this is referring to the Dukes of Brittany. And they were supposed to have had uh, their mansion and garden on this street extending to the town ditch because we are right on the edge of the city of London and you've got the River Fleet uh, right there. So it would have been a large house and gardens. And also it is shown in a 1570 map actually by uh, Braun and Hoggenberg. And uh, that might actually be the house uh, that uh, people are linking with the Dukes of Brittany. Also, the northern portion of Little Britain from St. Bartholomew's Hospital um, to up to West Smithfield. And that was formerly known as Duke Street, hence Dukes of Brittany. So Little Britain and Duke Street. And we can see from the registers, uh, from the rate collectors books and also from the half tax accounts. So these are basically taxes for having a fireplace uh, that there are lots of little areas known as little around, including little Bartholomew Close. And also um, we had uh, Petty Wales, which 
you'd assume was derived from the houses uh, being occupied before the suppression by a small colony of Welshmen. Um, and so Petty Wales, uh, we've also got uh, Little Britain linking there. And there was a Petty Wales in the parish of All Hallows Barking as well. And another one by the Custom House in Lower Thames Street. So this name, Little or Petty, seems to indicate little pockets of, uh, of migrant communities. It's hard to talk about um, the history of one particular street when you need to look at how it's linked with uh, the rest of the area. There was one particular event that happened nationally, um, but also happened arguably more intensively in London um, in terms of the impact was the dissolution of the monasteries during the reign of Henry VIII. And it was in 1539 that St. Bart's became victim to this. Now, a number of monastic churches were acquired by local people as parish churches. Some monastic hospitals, such as those for lepers at St. Giles and St. James's, where St. James's Palace is, they closed for good. But others, such as St. Bartholomew's and also St. Thomas's, uh, continued to as a secular institutions, um, even to this day. And land which once belonged to the church now belongs to the king. And in a grant to Sir Richard Rich in 1544... The Priory of St Bartholomew, the boundaries of Great St Bartholomew Close are set out. And Bartholomew Close, which was all part of uh, Little Britain, um, is regarded as a parish by itself. And it's, well, it's formed a precinct and the inhabitants enjoyed special privileges uh, such as freedom from arrest and also privileges originally granted to the ancient monastic foundation by Henry I. As London grew, the fashionable moved to the West, creating an opportunity for these areas to create a new identity. And this area was very busy and famous for booksellers, but the booksellers eventually moved to uh, Newgate Street and down to Paternoster Row and St Paul's Churchyard. And even though it may be a relatively small street, it isn't without its big names. For in 1712, Samuel Johnson, but he was only two and a half years old at the time, he first visited London uh, from Lichfield, his hometown, with his mother. And he and his mother lodged at a bookseller's here in Little Britain. Uh, maybe the bookseller knew... Samuel Johnson's father, Michael, um, as he was a bookseller in Litchfield. And it wasn't a pleasure trip. Uh, Johnson was one of 200 individuals to be given the royal touch by Queen Anne. And the royal touch was an ancient magical ceremony designed to treat scrofula. And Johnson had developed scrofula at aged about two years old from infective cow's milk. And this had caused many problems throughout his childhood and his eyes were severely effective. This is what they believed. So the treatment he'd already gone through as two and a half years old. Um, they had made an issue in his left arm, which was an incision um, where that was kept open with a small foreign body such as a pea. And this form of uh, therapy, it was designed to drain away any evil humours that were inside the body. None of that worked. And so Samuel, two and a half years old, comes and stays in Little Britain as he's waiting to be given the royal touch by Queen Anne. Johnson was examined by a court physician, blessed by the court chaplains and presented with a golden amulet by Queen Anne herself. And he wore this amulet around his neck forevermore. Unsurprisingly, Johnson's uh, scrofulosis sores were not cured and the scars on his face and neck were visible for the rest of his life, which was uh, upsetting for him, actually. He, uh, he read the material very close to his face. Uh, and Mr Thrale, his friend, uh, noted that Johnson's wigs, this is later on in his life, in his 60s, um, his wigs were scorched from reading too close to a candle, and he was afraid that uh, Johnson might actually burn himself while, while reading in bed. And he really seemed to hate the portrait that Sir Joshua Reynolds does of him, 
where he's uh, intently reading a book and he thought that it was actually showing or highlighting um, his weak eyes. Other big name residents in Little Britain include John Milton, the English poet and scholar. He lived on Little Britain briefly in 1662 and also in 1711. And he wrote about the area because he lived in it. And we use some of that in our episode six, Lost London, Hockley in the Hole episode. If you haven't heard that, have a listen and see how he describes the area back in the 18th century. Benjamin Franklin was another big lame, um, having lived on Little Britain. He arrived in London on Christmas Eve 1724 with the expectation of being able to buy the -the state-of-the-art printing press and return to Philadelphia and set it up in business with Sir William Keith. However, it soon became obvious that all of Keith's promises were frankly worthless and Franklin uh, found himself stranded in London and that could have been a really serious problem for anybody that was unskilled and also for unfamiliar um, in this large metropolis but of course he had um, sealed letters of both introductions and credits and he was able to find work at Palmer's and that was a printing firm housed in the former Lady Chapel of St Bartholomew the Great and it was with his friend James Ralph that he took up lodgings so the teenage Benjamin Franklin's first ever address was in Little Britain. It was close to his work and it also held a greater significance as Little Britain at the time was a really important centre of printing and publishing. And you could argue that it was a spiritual home for for Franklin. Um, It's where Samuel Buckley had printed uh, the Daily Current, which was London's first uh, daily newspaper in 1702 and was also the inspiration for the New England Current where Benjamin Franklin had served his first apprenticeship under the editorial eye of his elder brother James. Samuel Buckley was also the publisher of an even more important journal, uh, the first version of The Spectator. Uh, And this had an extraordinary uh, influence on the youthful Benjamin Franklin. And it's all happening around him. This is what's so excited. He was right in the middle of it all. Little Britain is now divided into three. So remember I mentioned the north part once being called Duke Street. And there's no sign of Addison or Buckley, let alone uh, Franklin here. Uh, And the street has changed completely uh, because of this ongoing building work for uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And it looks great now, but it's kind of lost this atmosphere. Um, So it's great to put the, the history together. But of course, it's not just those big names. Oh, no. Um, Also, it was where Charles Wesley's evangelical conversion took place in 1738. And it's also where Charles Dickens writes in Great Expectations in 1860 with the solicitor Jaggers. Um, This is where he has his office here in Little Britain. Booksellers had dominated the area from the mid-16th century and that was then followed by goldsmiths and trading of uh, cloth, a hangy cloth fair around the corner from the mid-18th century to the 20th centuries. Little Britain is also mentioned in the sketchbook, which is uh, the sketchbook of Geoffrey Crayon, um, which are 34 essays and short stories written by American author Washington Irving. And he came over to London to uh, try and help his family out. And he puts these essays, the British version of these essays, published in 1890 and 1820. And Little Britain is there. Oh, yes. In July 1820, the English version of Volume 2, Crayon describes the history provided to him by the superannuated tradesman, uh, which describes the heart of old London. In the centre of the great city of London lies a small neighbourhood, consisting of a cluster of narrow streets and courts of very venerable and debilitated houses, which goes by the name of Little Britain. Christchurch School and St Bartholomew's Hospital bound it on the west, Smithfield and Long Lane on the north. Aldersgate Street, like an arm of the sea, divides it from the eastern part of the city 
whilst the yawning gulf of Bull and Mouth Street separates it from Butcher Lane and the regions of Newgate. Over this little territory, thus bounded and designated, the great dome of St Paul's, swelling above the intervening houses of Potternoston Row, Armen Corner and Ave Maria Lane, looks down with an air of motherly protection. So in 1820, it sounds like it's a bustling community. And then in Robson's directory in 1832, it's still looking uh, pretty much the same. Uh, don't forget, such a sh short street, and yet it has four pubs. White Horse, Rose and Crown, Swan and Horseshoe, and Cock and Crown. And then 10 years later, we have another directory, so 1842. And uh, this time, there's a little bit more detail in some of the trades that are going on in the area. So we still have the four pubs, not surprising there. But we have uh, only one bookseller now. So an area that was filled with booksellers before. Only one is remaining at number 16. And then for food and essentials, you have a, a grocer and cheesemonger. We have a baker, a tobacconist and a greengrocer. So your essentials are right there. But then this is where the infiltration comes in of, uh, well, those from the clothing trade. So we had Smith and Sons leather workers. We have Lyle, who was a bootmaker. We have Miss James, who was a milliner. Benfield, um, a tailor, uh, another bootmaker at 46, and yet another tailor at 71. And in between those houses, you had skilled workers. So this included a lady who did fur and art flowers um, as a wholesaler, um, engravers, leather sellers, silver and tin workers, gold and silver wire makers, musical instrument maker, teapot handle maker wonder how many where well, we'd need of those nowadays uh, and also a gilt jeweler the difference here between the street is going from uh, fashionable house and gardens to then booksellers where of course there'll be also uh, printing uh, in the area and now moving to a place where people make things. They're making boots, they're making clothes, they're making leather works, they're making beautiful jewellery, they're making teapot handles and musical instruments. All highly skilled work, all very physical trades. Something we don't see very much of nowadays and this was the world that Charles Dickens had seen don't forget we're talking about 1832 1842 um, has anything really changed from then to when he is writing Great Expectations in 1860 as this is where he sets the solicitor's office of Mr Jagger which Pip needs to visit quite frequently so who knows what Little Britain will be like in the future. At the moment, it's got brand new spaces for shops, all empty, ready for the new tenants. And if you're in the area, why don't you have a little walk round? Maybe take a few photos and uh, tag us on social media. It'd be lovely to see you and your London explorations. That's all we've got time for now, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. And if you have, then why not click on those five stars or even better, write us a review. Thanks very much and I'll see you next week.